Pushun then we are a good join Oga with the Sintaman. A pitcher, a chin and dagot, or a gin went or a quaint among or a good join, and in as it can't among, as it can't among any went or a good join. What we're going to remember uh, is the oral. Uh, understanding the, what was what we heard from our, uh, our our uncles and our grandfathers and our great grandfathers who uh, were part of the treaty so we need we need that understanding we need to we need to share some things so that uh, our our treaty is gets stronger, we need uh, to say these kind of things about we've been a kind people and we've been a sharing people. Now we need to tell the truth because we have uh, our our rights are are diminishing. And we need to sound out what we asked for in treaty and what we understood as uh, our, uh, the treaty that we, that we understand. And those are things that uh, there were some outside promises made uh, at the time of treaty that helped our grandfathers to sign that treaty. That treaty was a, <clears throat> that treaty uh, text of the treaty, uh, it seems like it was a, a document printed before, before there was even uh, any discussions. And some of our, uh, some of our, uh, Thoughts, uh, uh, some of our uh, sharing uh, what we wanted in the treaty um, <clears throat> uh, wasn't in that original document. And so in order for our chiefs to sign, they, <clears throat> they had to uh, our, our, our uh, they promised us some some things in order for us to sign that treaty document. So we need uh, we need to share some of that knowledge uh, with you, and we have uh, today uh, uh, some of my. Uh, our people from Rosso here, Terry Nelson. My name is uh, Charlie Nelson, but I have a Nishnabe name and I have a clan. So we are part of a family, uh, that one clan is one family. And some, uh, some of our clan, we have, uh, we have leadership, we have elders and knowledge keepers in there. And we just kind of have that responsibility of looking after our family. And then there's other families here in our community. They have leadership and they have, and they have uh, knowledge keepers and they have workers in that family. And those where the children belong. They belong in those in those little uh, family structures. <clears throat> we want to have the opportunity to share some of this knowledge that we have, uh, because we uh, <clears throat> there was an oral part of our uh, treaty that we we need to share that ever so often so that uh, we're all saying uh, pretty much the same thing. We have the same knowledge 
us as First Nations people here of Rosa River. And so we, there's two parcels of land that we live on. So one is Rosa River here. I'm not too sure if that's two or two A or something like that. <laughs> but uh, there's another parcel of land it's called Rapids, Rosso Rapids. And, uh, and that's called Shibashkuteam. Uh, this one is Pogwa Nishkuzibi. The other one is Shibashkuteam. Uh, so two parcels of land, but one, it's one, uh, one treaty of Rosso, Rosso River. <coughs> and <coughs> We were originally uh, given, uh, uh, I don't know if we should say given, but uh, what was left for us was uh, uh, 30, uh, 160 acres for a family of five. Uh, that's 32 acres per person. <clears throat> Nowadays, we have somewhere around 2,800 plus you know, in our membership. So it's almost like 3,000 people living in Rosa River. But our land base is seems to be getting smaller and smaller. I mean, like uh, the acreages per person. Uh, if we were entitled at the time of treaty, 32 acres per person, it's now uh, some, uh, I think it's, my numbers might be uh, uh, not confirmed yet, but it's pretty close that we might have about 12,000 acres between the two reserves. <clears throat> and then if you divide uh, uh, 3,000 into 12,000, that's four four acres per person is what we have left. You know, originally we we're supposed to have 32 acres <clears throat> per person. <clears throat> That's what we, uh, what we want to do too is uh, have, have some uh, different areas of treaty. We want to we want to talk about certain items of the treaty that we, uh, uh, and I, I want to give some of that room to some of our speakers here uh, who are pre uh, prepared some things for, for us to hear. So <clears throat> I'm going to introduce uh, our kind of our, uh, our MC. He's going to kind of moderate uh, or who's next. And, how we gonna take a break or <laughs> uh, we have uh, uh, Richard Atkinson. He's uh, also a, a singer and uh, we're going to, this is my, uh, uh, the, the first part of our uh, treaty gathering. Uh, we've been trying to have this since, since uh, May uh, because uh, oh, we're we're going to have a, a 150 years of treaty, and we started out thinking we're going to have uh, four days of a uh, fire, and but we didn't have uh, we couldn't gather because of the COVID. So we now have uh, two days, two days. Yeah, but we're going to expand on that. Uh, if we need more days and more time, uh, we'll just go ahead and keep working at this uh, this uh, this whole treaty knowledge, our our recollection of what our treaty is all about. So I'm going to ask uh, Billy to uh, 
take it from here to introduce introduce us uh, um, some of the presentations that we would like to have heard uh, by uh, especially ourselves. You know, we we need to hear this uh, what we understand to be our treaty. I need to hear it every so often, and uh, I know we have a. We have some uh, opportunity for us to remember some things uh, about our treaty. So I wanna I wanna leave it to uh, Richard here to give us uh, introductions and uh, presenters of this uh, uh, treaty gathering. So we'll start there uh, for now. Oh, uh, maybe we're going to sing. Eh? We're going to have. We're going to have a. Uh, uh, so let you. <laughs> all right. Uh, good morning, friends and relatives. I'd like to thank you all for coming out here today to uh, share some of your input here for the uh, Treaty One gathering and celebrating the 150 years. I'd like to start off by saying uh, a miigwech to uh, Elder Charlie Nelson here for his kind words and his prayers here this morning for us. And also I'd like to call uh, my brother Jason Henry up here to share us a, an opening song here for our gathering here for the next two days. We all can please rise here for the song here. Thank you, Jason, for that song there. That song is on an original song from the community here, Rosa River. It was uh, composed by the late uh, Leonard Nelson. And it's always good to hear those old songs from the community being sung here in around the community at our gatherings we have and even at our, our powwow. So with that, I'll say miigwech to you again, Jason, for for rendering us a, a good song. And I don't know who's gonna be presenting first, coming up here to speak. Okay, we'll get uh, Donis Kennedy to come up here and share a little here. We have uh, 
I've seen Charlie hand out packs of smokes to three different people here. Adonis was one of them, and also Terry and that good-looking guy over there in the cowboy hat that looks like me, my dad. So, yeah, we'll get Adonis to come up here and share a little bit. And... Miigwech. Well, Shona and Dinaway Margaret Duck. Minawanago Gishiko Nindish Nikas, Wabaje Shi and Dodem, Baguanish, Kuzi Bing and Donji. I guess I'll start with uh, what I'm presenting. It's good to be home and it's good to be asked to be here. I'm happy to just sit and listen and take notes. Um, but I was asked by our uncle to bring forward some of the words of the court that talk about treaty. And so I took a couple quotes and about why it's important to everyone how it is that we ourselves understand our treaty and our memory. And part of the reason and the need to do this is because of the impact of the relationship over the last 150 years since the treaty. Because the treaty wasn't fulfilled, because of the way that the treaty was devalued, because of the way that our ancestors were devalued, because of the way that our thoughts, our memory, and our understanding were devalued, it's important to say this. And it's important for me to have this said for our children and for our grandchildren, that we're able to put this together how we think our memory, our thoughts, our understanding of the treaty that this is put together. It's something that we're reaching far back to do. It's something that where we reach so far back to pull forward this understanding, we're doing that through 60s scoop. We're doing that through day school. We're doing that through residential school. We're doing that through, through dispossession. We're doing that through oppression. We're doing that through generation after generation after generation of devaluing and delegitimating our knowledge, our memory, our understanding, and our way of being in the world. So this is a big work but it's an important work. It's a significant work. And it's the work that will allow our young people not to have to say, to rely on other people's words, to understand why our memory matters. So we're doing this work so that our young people just know that the way that they understand the treaty, the way that they understand the, our ancestors' knowledge, the way that they understand their belonging in Turtle Island, that that isn't questioned by them and it isn't questioned by others. That's what I want to see. We're not there yet. <laughs> There's still a lot of work to do. And for me, I think that's one of the most important things. Um, my uncle, both of them actually did for me. You know, they gave me a copy of the shocking truth about Indians in textbooks when I was a teenager. And they told me, you know, that this has affected your mind, the way you think the way you think about yourself, understand this. Now I work for the organization that, <laughs> that uh, actually that publishes the shocking truth about Indians in textbooks and it's republished and it still is relevant today. 
And when I was in law school, that's one of the most significant papers that I wrote is I went and I found the textbook that I was educated into. It was about a year off, I think, but I don't think they changed that much in one year. <laughs> but I could found a copy of the textbook that when I was in grade four, I learned about who I was as an Anishinaabe person, and I learned about treaty. I found that book and I read through all of the different biases that are outlined in the shocking truth about Indians in textbooks. And I looked at my textbook and I looked at how much of the biases in that textbook I carried within me. That when things didn't match what I was told, <laughs> what I was told in my family, what I was told in my community, and when I came home and listened in ceremony, and the way that things were talked about, the way that treaty was talked about, the way that who we are was talked about, the way that our law was and our governance was talked about. You heard about our governance system already, our clan system. That's our family system, our governance system. But it's also, it's our national governance system. And it's about much, much, it's got a greater significance than what is recognized and what was recognized within those textbooks. Within that textbooks, um, you know, the way that I thought about it, we were talked about in a really negative way, you know, and that continued from grade four, and I tracked a lot of my textbooks from grade four elementary all the way up to law school when I was reading about Hobbes and Kant and Locke, people who are still taken as a primary source about our governance, our law, and our people, even our humanity. They're taken as the primary source even though they never step foot here <laughs> and they say that our lives are nasty brutish and short you know that we had no law that we had no governance you know and that treaty everything that has to do with our people our ancestors got a I say a little when I talk to kids I say uh, I do a lot of presenting for kids but I say it's small T treaty. It's not big T treaty. It's small M medicine. It's not big M medicine. It's small L law. It's not big L law. And that's the way that I was raised. And that's why it was important. I took a whole year to write that paper and I took two classes and I handed it in for that, for both those classes. I got credit for two classes for that one paper. And I went through and I really questioned myself where that came from and why. And that process is just a very small part of what the Canadian court is starting to do. It's just starting to do for itself. So it's looking back at those same questions and court people are saying, Look, if we were the ones in the wrong, how do we rely on all these years of precedence to make it right? All these years of bias, how do we look to that to come up with how to live in a good way with the people who are of these lands? That's what they're saying. And maybe they haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> But I want to share the best of what I could find. Um, and it's a little bit out of date because it's been a while since I've been in law school. But uh, I figure, you know, if they're 150 years behind honoring the treaty, you know, me being a bit like 10 years late on my citations is all right. <laughs> I'm doing okay. I could probably get caught up by tomorrow. I also 
brought forward something from a friend of mine, um, a May Craft. She wrote, um, it's called Treaty Interpretation, A Tale of Two Stories. And I found probably, I thought was the best thing to bring forward here to share. And it was in a footnote. So I have the citation there. So I got a couple of quotes from court, um, from the Chief Justice Lemaire and from the court in R versus Badger. And I also have quotes that she assembled from multiple courts about treaty interpretation. Yeah, so I'll start with Delgamuk. Delgamuk um, in 1997, Chief Justice Lemaire, writing for the majority of the Supreme Court of Canada, determined that oral traditions must be placed on an equal footing with the types of historical evidence that courts are familiar with. Next. Uh, in R versus Badger, the court talked about the treaties were drafted in English by representatives of the Canadian government who it should be assumed were familiar with common law doctrines. Yet the treaties were not translated in written form into the languages of the various Indian nations who were signatories. Even if they had been, it is unlikely that the Indians who had a history of communicating only orally would have understood them any differently. As a result, it is well settled that the words in the treaty must not be interpreted in their strict technical sense, nor subjected to their rigid modern rules of construction. Rather, they must be interpreted in the sense that they would naturally have been understood by the Indians at the time of the signing. So that's kind of what I found. It's the best. <laughs> it's some of the best from the court, but it still already has a way to go. It has a long way to go because they still have within their minds what was placed within my minds through my textbook is that our ancestors didn't know how to govern. They didn't know how to carry law. They didn't know how to create treaties. And having sat and listened to our elders, I know that isn't true because it wasn't the first time we made treaty. We have, we hold treaty with the Dakota. And if you sit and listen to the story of the big drum, you might have an understanding of that. We hold treaty with the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. And if you sit and listen to the reading of the wampum belts, you might start to understand that. We hold treaty not only with humans, but also with animals, plants, insects, <laughs> fish, even stars. And if you sit for long enough with our elders and you hear the creation story, you might begin to understand that. This was not the first treaty that our ancestors came together to put together for us. They had a way of doing that. So I think this is a little bit of a start, <laughs> but I don't think I'd pass them yet. <laughs> I'd send them a little bit uh, to do a little bit more work in the way that they think about things. But, and because we're in Bagawanish Kozibing, I get to decide that. <laughs> I get to decide, even the Supreme Court of Canada, how well they're doing in understanding treaty. And my friend, Amay Craft, I'd like to, she selected a bunch of things that I'd like to put, yeah. So Aboriginal treaties constitute a unique type of agreement and attract spe special principles of interpretation. So, when you're coming to look at treaties between Anishinaabe people and the Crown, there's special rules of interpretation. 
And I don't think that's based on a deficit of our ancestors' capacity. I think that's based on a deficit of the court's ability to understand the thoughts that were put into the tobacco, that were placed in, into the pipe that was lifted by our ancestors. But I'd agree, <laughs> just for different reasons. Treaties should be liberally construed and ambiguities or doubtful expressions should be resolved in the favor of Aboriginal signatories, in our favor. Next. The goal of treaty interpretation is to choose from among the various possible interpretations of common intention, the one with which best reconciles the interests of both parties at the time the treaty was signed. And when it comes to what is in our best interest, what was in our ancestors' best interest and what is in the best interest of our descendants, only we can know that. Only we can know that. No one else can put that together for us. Next. In searching for the common intention of the parties, the integrity and honor of the crown is presumed. And I think after reviewing historical records, most people will come to the same conclusion that that's a big presumption. And it changes. It changes everything that happened if you assume that it's done with integrity. Next. In determining the signatories' respective understanding and intention, the court must be sensitive to the unique cultural and linguistic differences between the parties. That means that how we understand treaty, how we understand that relationship, how we understand that tradition of making treaty and how we understand the treaty our, ourselves, that is significant. Next. The words of the treaty must be given in the sense they naturally would have held for the parties at the time. So for me, like our uncle said already, you know, they pre-wrote it. And when I looked for the treaty and I read it, I was, I, I just didn't feel, I felt so bad about it, reading what was written. And that's because none of our ancestors' thoughts and intentions are in that writing. They are all within that tobacco that was lifted in the pipe and in what was passed down. Next, a technical or contractual interpretation of the treaty wording should be avoided. A treaty isn't the same thing as a contract that you negotiate out for. It's a whole law that's a meeting point of two legal traditions. Next, while construing the language generously, Courts cannot alter the terms of the treaty by exceeding what is possible on the language. Next. Treaty rights of Aboriginal peoples must not be interpreted in a static or rigid way. They are not frozen at the date of signature. The interpreting court must update treaty rights to provide for their modern exercise. This involves determining what modern practices are reasonably incidental to the core of a treaty right in its modern context. So even though I might not be able to use a plow, maybe I could use a car, I don't know. <laughs> but it shouldn't be frozen in time. That's it. And I am, I just wanna say miigwech for the time here. And what I most want to do, I was asked to bring forward the words of the court that recognize that
that our own understanding and our elders' understanding is significant, what our oral history tells us. But I also want to say that for me, it's more important. I don't need to hear that from the court of Canada to know that the thoughts and prayers and intentions of our ancestors are significant and meaningful, not only to me, but for every generation that comes after me. And I know this because I've listened to our elders today. And I know the integrity and the love and the kindness that they put into their words. And through them, I understand our ancestors and the way that they would have approached that tobacco that they lifted at the signing of the treaty. Miigwech, mikanigana. Okay, uh, thank you, Donis, for your presentation. That was, that was a good one. Um, who are you gonna get up, up here next, Terry? Or we got 45 minutes to lunch, so I'm pretty sure that'll be. <laughs> okay, I'll switch the mic over here to uh, Terry for his presentation. I'm a witch, uh, nephew. And um, thank you very much. I just want to uh, introduce myself. Uh, um, my name is uh, Terence Nelson, my English name. I'm from Rosa River Anishinaabe First Nation. I'm from the Lynx Clan. Um, I guess I've, uh, I've had a lot of work done in, in terms of treaty number one, in terms of treaties, and I've uh, been asked to present some information. And what, what's very important about this information, uh, what, we're, what we're presenting here is that it's being recorded it's it's uh it's live it's going to youtube it's uh there's links out there there's people listening out in the in this area and rosa river Anishinaabe first nation has been one that's uh you know been uh put down by the uh, you know, like uh way back in 1871 the the treaty uh, people uh, the federal negotiators they were saying that it was a uh, rosa was very um uh, obstinate in the way that they understood things and they uh they put us down because it was very clear the um and one of the things that i um i want to start out with is that to remember some of the um what donis is saying talking about donis is a uh you have your master's in law right your she had her master's in law and um she went through that system but uh, charlie here is 72 years old I'm 68. Uh, we look back at the uh, where we were taught uh, by people in in, in uh, within the lodge and then within also the uh, uh, the Medewan lodge and also the uh, you know our ancestors. And we have a direct line to the 1871 treaty. And there are people in the, here that are listening on the uh, on the links. Uh, that are hearing some of this stuff probably for the first time. I remember uh, Gilbert Martin. He was one of the elders here in, in Rosa River. I was in my 20s, and um, he was talking about uh, how our reservation was all the way from Sprague all the way to the foothills of uh, past Morden. And I kind of laughed at him because I, you know, being young, I didn't know anything about treaties. And here this old, this old man is... Uh, is telling me how big our reservation was. 
it took me a long while to remember what would happen that in fact he was he was absolutely correct that the uh, the uh, treaty treaty number one was uh, about sixteen thousand seven hundred square miles of land, and uh, he talked about the way where what came started out on the other side of Sprague, all the way to uh, Morden, all the way up uh, into the middle of the Lake uh, Lake Lake Winnipeg, Lake Manitoba, and uh, so that was what was discussed. So I want to um, present one little part. I know Don has uh, mentioned some of this stuff that the, um, in regard to the courts, but what, uh, what, what was said in, uh, by Justice uh, Dixon, uh, Supreme Court of Canada, he, he said, Aboriginal title is a legal right derived from the historic occupation of tribal lands by native people. It is not something that was given to native people by, the, by some government, by royal proclamation, or by the signing of treaty. Very, very important understanding. And um, I want to know, I want people to understand those that are listening in the link. Our rights do not come from treaty. I want to be very, very clear on that. Your rights do not come from treaty. In fact, one of the things is that the treaty was asked for by the Crown. It was asked for by the white people, the immigrants. Uh, basically what happened in 1763, the Royal Proclamation, um, there was a fight. Uh, what they call the Pontiac War, but the uh, Undawa, Potawatomi, the Ojibwe's, they had, a, they had a fight. They captured the 11 British forts. So there was nine that were uh, totally seized. Two of them were under, uh, they were still being seized. They were, they were still being, uh, they were trying to occupy those, those two forts. They're trying to defeat those. And what happened was that King George III uh, signed this royal proclamation because 2,000 British settlers and soldiers uh, died in that, uh, in that Pontiac, what they call the Pontiac War. But they fought back. They fought back against the immigrants. And that's why it says, you know, that uh, the Aboriginal title was not simply something that was given. And uh, King George III, when he signed the Royal Proclamation in 1763, it wasn't something out of a uh, goodness of his heart. 2,000 British soldiers died and 2,000 British people died at that, that time because our people fought back for their lands. And one of the things that is very clear in this is that uh, we don't get our rights from the treaties. The word uh, Anishinaabe, which is in our Ojibwe language, uh, Eddie Benton Bene talks about that as A Nisina Abe. What that means is that from whence lowered man. Essentially, what uh, Eddie Benton was saying is that our people were put on the earth by the Creator. We came from the stars. This place was made for us. As Anishinaabe, as Anishinaabe people, and it's very clear. That's what jo, uh, Mohawk Joseph Brandt said. We are of the same opinion with the people of the United States. You consider yourselves as independent people. We, as the original inhabitants of this country and sovereigns of the soil, look upon ourselves as equally independent and free as any other nation or nations. So you're, as a nation. As a people, um, our treaties aren't just 1871, 150 years ago in treaty number one. It's also 1863, the Red Lake uh, Permanent Bands Treaty in the United States. And our cousins in uh, Red Lake, Leech Lake, White Earth, Turtle Mountains, uh, Net Lake, those are all our relatives, we as Anishinaabe people. And in our Ojibwe language, when we call ourselves Anishinaabe, 
we're actually saying uh, in our language what the white people call us indigenous people. And it was the immigrants that came to us and said, and came to our ancestors and said, we want to sign a treaty with you. So before they had any rights or access to Treaty 1 territory, the 16,700 square miles of land that is uh, in Southern Manitoba, they didn't have any rights. They had no rights in our lands. So they got their rights from treaty. So when people keep saying our treaty, the reality is the immigrants who got their rights from the treaty, not us. We have inherent rights. We were here before. We are the first peoples of these lands. And uh, that's how we as indigenous peoples, as the Anishinaabe people, whether it's in Mohawk territory, whether it's in over here, whether it's in the United States, they cut off, they used a border. There's a border over there about 11 miles from here. Uh, that's on that side is the United States, on this side is Canada. But the reality is that it's all Anishinaabe land on both sides of the border. And part of the problem is that we, we, um, we allow that border to stop us from being Anishinaabe on both sides. So I remember the, some of the elders, when they, when they were talking, they're saying in, in the lodge, you know, they said, um, Nigan Jinabi, and then you have to look to the future. They're, they're saying, you know, you got to remember there was young people that are going to be here. And then they said, and they win on. And they win on to win. Where are they going to get life? That's what they were saying. It was a. Uh, Anyway, there was a uh, the specific. Uh, yeah, I'm asleep, buddy, Charlie. <laughs> I put him to sleep. <laughs> and and this treaty, uh, uh, basically, what uh, this information that we're we're trying to share here from Rose River, it is being recorded. It is a message to our young people. Maybe even 50 years from now they'll be still looking back and saying to us, you know, hey, they left, you know, this is what they were thinking back in 2021. But we look back and um, if you can go ahead. So the, the, it is the desire of Her Majesty to open up a settlement in immigration, a tract of land bounded in here and described, uh, mentioned to obtain the consent thereto of her Indian subjects sub inhabiting the said tract and make a treaty and arrangement with them so that there may be peace and goodwill between them and her majesty and that they may know and be assured of what allowance they are, count up, they are to count upon and receive year by year from her majesty's bounty and benevolence. That's basically, that, that's the text of the treaty. What happened was that on um, August 2nd, uh, 1871 at the treaty at the Lower, lower Stone Fort, the Anishinaabe people were going to walk away. They basically were going on August 2nd, they said, the hell with that. I, I don't hear nothing in here that benefits our, our people. So James McKay, the Métis interpreter uh, for the government, for working for the federal government, asked for one last uh, meeting for the evening of, evening of August 2nd. And so Simpson, Archibald and uh, them, they, they, they made so many outrageous promises to the native people. The next morning, uh, the treaty was signed on August 3rd, but the text of the treaty remained the same. Those outside promises, the promises that were made then were not included in the treaty. The treaty didn't get uh, changed based on the promises of uh, August 2nd. So the native people or our people, they looked at that and they said, uh, um, you know, they asked for a text of the, uh, of the treaty. They wanted a copy of the treaty. And so when they got sent the, 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 the treaty and they got it interpreted, they said, these guys were liars. 
they lied. They lied about this uh, the treaty and the promises that were made. And in 1875, the federal government of Canada recognized that there were outside promises made in Treaty No. 1 and 2. So that August 2nd uh, promises that were made, they were so outrageous. Um, the, uh, so there was a lot of stuff that was um, that was said, and um, I did a paper, you know, like uh, Treaty One Remembered, and I put in place a lot of my information. But there was a man, and you're looking back, why our family is so strong in this uh, understanding of treaty. Um, there was a man that was that was there. Uh, Actually, what happened was that the Ojibwe people, whenever something was important, they would put young people in those uh, in those negotiations to remember and to carry forward, uh, come, become basically a library of information going forward and telling the people in the future what was negotiated. There was a man named Asini Inin. Uh, he was 12 years old at the time of treaty. We know that because he was he was born in 1859. He was 12 years old. He died in 1946. So he was 87 years old when he died. Uh, Sini Inen, um, he'd be at the treaty uh, and um, he was a frustrated person because in 1927, the uh, federal government of Canada uh, put in place a, a law, section 141 or is it 141? or 114, something like that. Anyway, there was a section of the, of the Indian Act that said that no lawyer could sit with native people uh, because the what happened was that the Mohawks, one of the things that they were responding to was the Mohawks. The Mohawks, the, uh, what they did was so when the legal nations uh, came in place, they, uh, they went to the legal nations and said that they were sovereigns. They wanted to be recognized as the um, as a as a nation internationally and in the legal nations. Well, Ireland and um, and Iran and a few other uh, countries were were actually trying to uh, recognize the the Mohawks as a nation, and England came along and. Uh, Put that down. Next after that was they couldn't join the League of Nations. They went to court. And that's how come they have that section 141 of the uh, of the Indian Act where um, you know they went to court and they uh, they tried to get the government and the, the courts to understand that they were nations. They were not simply people uh, subject to Canadian law. So that's how come section 141 came in place and they ended up. Um, so from 1927 to 19, 1951, for those years, it was illegal for any lawyer to be with Native people. The lawyer would go to jail if uh, he actually met with the Native people and try to represent them. So that's important for people to understand that treaties were never interpreted in the courts. They were never, all of that information that a Sydney Nin had and uh, they cannot come again on. Uh, some of the elders from here, from Rosso, they didn't get to present their information in court. Sidney Inen was a very frustrated person because uh, as he was, as the Indian agent would come here to Rosso, uh, he'd be handing out the, the treaty money. Sidney Inen came there with his cane and he'd hit the, he'd hit the, uh, uh, the table where the Indian agent was, and, and he he said, and my dad remembers him saying that he said, he said, "Kawid, did you on him?" He said, "No, you're lying." I know what the promises were made to to our people. He said, and uh, he would hit the he'd hit his cane on that thing, and uh, he he knew that there wasn't there was a hell of a lot more than just five dollars. Uh, you know, treaty payment. There was a lot more. 
And that's important for us to remember. So this was not just in, um, in 1996, uh, we signed a, what do we call a treaty land entitlement. Very, very important for people to understand. There's 1.3 million acres in the province of Manitoba that where the federal government of Canada agreed that there would be, I, I don't know if you can see that. Let me, let me see, uh, check, see where, uh, if people can see this, maybe download some of this stuff. Uh, Cindy, uh, Cindy Nen, born, lived, died in 1946. For 75 years, Cindy Nen was a living library who carried a message, passed on the uh, treaty negotiations uh, to several gener generations. Cindy Nen had a younger brother named Bejiko Gabo standing alone, who was many years younger. My father remembers a Cindy Nen told him, I was already a man when my br younger brother, Joe Pierre, was born. Pejuko Gabu, the younger brother of Sininen, also lived to be over 80, 80 years old and died in 1964. He carried a lot of Sininen's information, same message that his older brother carried. Uh, Sininen's English name was Andrew Pierre. So then we uh, can move on a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, keep going. But uh, yeah, just keep going. Uh, there was a um, Kikinat coming along. There's another one on my mom's side of the family. And he was, uh, he had a photographic memory. And uh, he, had the, uh, he had the physical documents, the outside promises memorandum and a copy of the treaty. So he carried those and uh, it went into Dominion City. Uh, Jim Waddell uh, and uh, Ann Waddell gave those to my mom after Jim Waddell died. So, go ahead. Yeah, so there's some information here that I probably can I document a whole lot of stuff. So, go ahead, keep going. So what the United Nations said, indigenous people have been, in, uh, have been and still are victims of racism, racial discrimination, and the imposition of arbitrary and imposed administration of regimes, which inevitably deny their human rights and fundamental freedoms. And here's what the United Nations said, the concept of terra nullis conquest and discovery as modes of territorial acquisition are repugnant, have no legal standing, and they're entirely without merit or justification to substantiate any claim to their legacies, any to substantiate any claim to the lands. That's just not quite right. So anyway, um, but anyway, it's not, not written right there. Uh, but basically it's saying that the United Nations, it was saying that the, uh, the idea that somehow, you know, uh, discovery or you know conquest or anything else of that is uh, is legal. It's not legal. So what we say as Anishinaabe people, and that's a message to our people in the in the future, fifty years from now. Right now, what we're saying to you, and it's being recorded, the treaties are not the source of our of our rights. We are the owners of the land, and the ones that got their rights from the treaty was the immigrants. So very important for us to understand that. Uh, there's 1.3 million acres um, possible of new reservation lands under the, under the TLE agreements. And in, Rose, in the case of Rosa River, we signed a TLE um, in 1996. And it was up to, for up to 16,218 acres. But in that 1996 agreement, it said the federal government recognized that there was 5,861 acres of shortfall. Shortfall is the land that was supposed to be reserved land in 1870, 1871. It didn't get created in 1871. So these, this reservation is short, at least a minimum of 5,861 acres. So what they said in, um, in 1996, where they settled 
for $14 million uh, compensation. And then we were supposed to buy up to 16,218 acres of land. And then we would create new reserve lands. The, uh, since 1996, in 25 years, only 75 acres of land has been created for new reservation lands. That's 75 acres on the north, northwest side of uh, Winnipeg that was created and it was recognized by the federal government in 2007. So we still have almost 16,000 acres of new land, new reservation lands to be created. And we also have 7,949 acres under the 1903 surrender. 1903, uh, they took 12 sections of our reservation lands. And uh, so we got that settled in, in uh, 2011. We got an $80 million settlement on that one. Plus, uh, we we're, were able to buy the 7,949 acres again. We have 24,167 acres of new reservation lands for Rosa River that we can purchase and we can convert to reserve status. So that's the direction we're going in. That means the urban reserves in the city of Winnipeg, we are going to go after the urban reserves in the city of Winnipeg, plus some other lands, even on the ones on near Emerson. So on the border. So those are, that's my information. Um, it is very, very important for us to understand that, you know, I guess um, what our people were saying is that uh, It's very clear that the uh, that our people hung on to these um, outside promises. They didn't just simply give it, give up, give up. And they they said uh, they said that they wanted to make sure that this reservation lands. Um, what the what the government what what they remember saying was that. from Long Plains, Aitapi Pitang was on his legs again. God gave me this land you are speaking to me about, and it has kept me well to this day. I look on nothing but my property. I have turned over this matter of a treaty in my mind, and I cannot see anything in it to benefit my children. I'll go home today to my own property without being treated with. You, the commissioner, can please yourself. If therefore the commissioner wants the land, let him take it. The old brave continued in this strain a long time. D.J. Hall, pages 350 to 351. Our people were telling them that this is our land. We don't need a treaty. And uh, they're going to walk away. So those outside promises are very, very important to our people that said, you know, they signed the treaty and uh, they were lied to. A lot of the text of the treaty isn't as it should be. So I thank Donis for reminding the people that, uh, you know, in her being having a master's in in in, uh, in law, very clear message to the uh, to the courts, to the immigrants that what we're saying here to our people, we don't need treaty rights. We need our inherent rights recognized that we are the first peoples of these lands and that um, we're going to continue to move forward on uh, establishing new reservation lands. And in the treaty, it says 160 acres per family of five. So what I'm saying to our people, um, the treaty talks about family lands. So every time I talk to our people, I say, where's your lands? Where's your family lands? So we're still operating under the Indian Act and where all of our reservation lands are under the con control of chief and council. And I can say that because I'm an elected member of, uh, of council. We're still operating under the Indian Act where we have all of our lands being in the control of chief and council. And that's not the way the treaty is supposed to be. The treaty says 160 acres per family of five. So you have a, a, as an individual, a right, a personal piece of land and as a family, you have a right to your own family lands. And those, uh, we got to quit following the Indian Act. We have to go back to the treaty. It says 
here's here's your you, know, you have the right to have your own personal lands and to benefit from your own personal lands. See what happens is that everything that happens here in Rosa River in terms of uh, the reservation lands, the benefit only goes to chief and council. We need to make sure that if you have an urban reserve in the city of Winnipeg, it can be owned by family or it can be owned as a certificate of possession as a personal piece of reservation land, not just simply Rosa River under chief and council. So that's my my presentation. I know it's long and boring, but <laughs> but it is important for people to understand. And that is our message to our young people in the future. Niganji Nabing, we have to look to the future and we have to give them that message. We didn't give up your rights and we'll continue to think about you guys in the future. Miigwech. Oh, good enough. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Terry, with your presentation. Charlie, nice to see you awake again. <laughs> uh, we'll ask my, uh, my father to come up here and say a little. I'm more than likely ask him just to sit down because he can't stand too long, but he can sit here and share a little with us here. I'll turn the mic over here to my dad, Richard Nelson. Morning, new news in the Shinabek. Makonin do them. Well, I'm going to talk about, say, about that Indian act, but what I just what my grandfather told me. Long time ago, the RCMP cannot come in a reserve. But without, without the chief's permission. Well, the chief a long time ago used to have a, just like an RCMP, yellow stripe and a red tunic. And when they first made treaty of what they told me, Queen Victoria told that the chief, he took a, some pieces off her dress, that yellow stripe and that blue and that red. You have the same torrid orders of the RCMP. And the RCMP want to arrest somebody, they have to come and see you. Well, that, that was I heard too. But the only time, one time too, I heard uh, some, some people, I don't know, when they got charged with murder at the reserve at one time, three of them. And that was a big, serious crime. Well, when the when, when I had a court at the reserve, I guess the chief is sat with those three guys, so not to come come wrong with them. But I thought that is too. When I changed my subject again to what 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 you told the Indian people that they do the promises, promise a plow. Cultivated a brindle and horses to farm. And they do see the, I said, that one part I always remember too, you used to get the one of those called Quebec heaters, a, a box soup. You used to get that to eat the house. When you used to get the lamb, the uh, lamb too, uh, to paint white. And you used to get boards to make a floor. They used to give us a uh, seed to make a garden. I thought I was told too, and uh, everything was, was given to us. And again, uh, I go back to uh, Sandra 1903. But what my grandfather told me it was uh, the Senator of him and Ada and saying, uh, she says, and another Sandy, another of them. Well, when I mean, they signed that treaty, I guess they got them drunk and they bought some women with them <laughs> to, cheat, to cheat on them. Huh? <laughs> and that's all about what I told me. And uh, 
And again, I'll, I'll change the subject again. And I used to go to day school, or oh, that, uh, that uh, teacher didn't like me because I was, uh, that did the Indian way. Yeah, actually, one time I had a sort of see one piece of religion, huh? Yeah, so who made the land? So Winterbush made the land. So one time there was a big flood one time. And then oh, uh, Winterbush, they ran, they ran up the tree, huh? <laughs> so he went down and water kept coming, coming, coming. You seen a little muskrat running around. See me, sorry, he said, my little brother, go and get some land for me. Well, he came up that little, opened his hand a little bit of dread, and he must have drowned. And the mighty birds took that land, like that dirt, <laughs> blew it. Oh, you see, you know, the grass, trees, you know, and it came up once for the earth, kept blowing like this, blowing. And he's had that a, a fox, and the, when they got to die, that fox, and he brought him back to life again. He told him, Go and run around. She said, See how it was done. No, 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 he came back again. Some more they told him, man. He kept blowing, blowing, came back again. Told him, uh, The fox said, Some more. Okay, blew, blew there about half an hour. They let him go, but he take off again. Two, three, four, three, four, he never came back that fox. Must have died of old age. <laughs> and then there's a how that land was big. <laughs> and that was the, the better, you know, I can want to say, I'll say him some more words tomorrow. <laughs> we got in the matter. Thank you, Mr. All right, uh, thank you there, Richard, my dad. Thank you for speaking and sharing a little bit here with us today, this morning. Um, I'd like to ask Peter Atkinson to come up here and you know, he wanted to say a few words. Charlie has some same out here for you there, Peter. Amigwech, Ujo, Tabasan could need the Jenicas, Mikanak do them, Niving Ma, GP, the Game of David Garning. I want to talk about uh, the treaty um, uh, from day one, from day one, from when they signed the treaty. Um, it was our clan, clan government, our clan leaders that signed the treaty. It wasn't chiefs and councils, as you see now, it wasn't them. Um, because uh, the, the clan mothers at the time uh, said, or what they did, um, agree with uh, the treaty and they instructed the treaty, the, the leaders, the leaders, the, the uh, Gani Gani Ziyad, I call them, I don't call them chiefs. Chiefs are is the derogatory term. Ghani is the ones that lead. That's, uh, the clan mothers selected them to, in place of leadership in that. So uh, they, they were instructed to sign off on the treaty. That's why you see a whole bunch of names on there. You don't just see four names or five names on there. You see a whole bunch of names on there, on the, on the, on the paper. And there's some uh, little animals there, birds or something, that uh, that's their clans. And uh, we have to think about that, you know. Uh, we we have to really go back to day one. Day one never happened of the treaty. Day one, the last time there was a treaty was um, in 1817, the Selkirk Treaty. That was the last time that there was ever a treaty. Uh, I use this uh, example here uh, in my presentation. There's, there's a, a white guy that wanted to uh, this section of land 
and uh, he come to us and he consulted us. And then we gave our consent for him to have that land, use that land. It's not his land. It's still our land. It's still our land, but we get, it's, it's okay for him to use that. And then he, we signed off on a treaty. That's a treaty. That's an agreement. And uh, so we, that was the last time that there was ever a treaty. That's how I see it. Because at that time, we owned the land. The legal, the legal uh, way of saying uh, the treaties are legally binding is consultation and consent. That's what makes them legally binding. Nothing else is not Canadian law or anything. It's nothing else. It's consultation. We were consulted and we gave our consent. That was, that's a way of treaty works. It doesn't work any other way. That's what makes them legal. And then um, we, we signed off on a treaty and that makes it okay for him to, to use that land. It's not his land. You've got to remember that it's not his land yet. Yeah, it never will be his land because all this land is still ours. The reserves are not even legal. There's no such thing as reserves for us supposed to be. Where did they get the right to say, we, we will give you 160 acres per family of five. Where did they get the right to say that? That's the one question I never heard of, of I never heard answered yet. Where did they get the right to say that? We will give you 160 acres per family of five. That's our land they're giving us. Where did they get the right to say that? They never did. We were never consulted on it. And even if we were consulted on, on it, we probably wouldn't have given our consent to it. And that's what I think of these, these old people that signed the treaties. They knew what they were doing. And we're interpreting that as different, differently here. We're interpreting it differently. We're looking at it from the Indian Act. And that's why I say we're looking at it from the Indian Act because we're saying, well, we have this treaty land entitlement. There's no such thing as treaty land entitlement. That land is still ours. They're trying to uh, continue to keep us, uh, keep us uh, on board their, their, their ship kind of thing. Okay? Because when, when you look at it, uh, the, the Wampum Belt Treaty spells out exactly what, what we're supposed to be doing. There's two, two ships, two vessels going along, along a, a line here. And there's law, their laws and their customs and their, their, their uh, policies or whatever, they, they stay on their ship. And our laws, we stay in our canoe. And we, we travel at the same pace forward. That's what you call um, nation to nation. The, the, uh, the reason uh, uh, the um, treaty, uh, what do you call that treaty? Uh, intent, intent of treaty is to, um, to live here together, to be here together. And nothing else. We have to get back to day one. Day one has never happened. What did we do in, on, in day one? We signed a treaty. But that never was honored. Nothing was honored at, at that time. That's why I say day one never happened. Instead, five years after we signed the treaty, 1876, they, leg they legislated the Indian Act and imposed that on us. It imposed it on us. And here we are living in the Indian Act. And I don't like that. We're living in the Indian Act. 
We're living in their policy. We're talking about their policies. We're not talking about Anishinaabe, what, what Anishinaabe did at that time. We're, we're all talking about uh, policy. And uh, there's a lot more I'd like to say, but I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, there's, there's so much more to say. Uh, maybe with, uh, two, within the two days uh, that we're here, maybe I'll be able to uh, share uh, the rest of what I want to say. But we need to go get back to day one. Who signed the treaties? The clans. Clan leaders signed the treaties. They were instructed by the clan mothers. Clan mothers are the number one, are the, num uh, are the law of the land. They are the law of the land. Get that straight. Clan mothers are the first law of the land. I'm, I'm going to present, make a presentation to the court. Uh, one of these uh, court days when, I, when the court happens in Emerson, I'm gonna go up there and talk to that, that judge and tell him that. They, they can't be judging our people. I did that in when uh, Ken Henry them took us to court that time, and when we went to uh, Winnipeg and saw the uh, the uh, um, what you call that uh, that judge there, that uh, federal judge. He asked us to come up here and come up there and say something, and I went up there and I told him, you know, we're not supposed to be here. I told him, and he said, yeah, yeah, we're not. You guys aren't supposed to be here. You guys have your own, your own way of dealing with things. You're a nation. That's what he said. You, you shouldn't be here. And, and, and that time there was a Ken Henry and them, they, they, they uh, presented uh, that they were uh, legally um, ousted here, but they shouldn't have taken it there. We have nothing to do with their courts. We are Anishinaabe, that's who we are. We have no reason to take, the treaties don't belong in their courts. A treaty, the treaties are, are, are of, uh, of an agreement between two, two parties. And the Treaty One area, uh, they call I call it an area. I don't call it a territory, because we have a territory. There's no Manitoba, no Saskatchewan, no Ontario in that territory. East, east, north, uh, west, north, south, wherever our land is spoken, that's our territory. Our territory. We share a territory in the hunting area in Riding Mountain with the Cree people. We share that, and uh, we we don't. Um, no, I lost my train of thought here. <laughs> uh, um, where were I? Sorry. Okay, territory. Yeah, the treaty area. Treaty one. Treaty one is just an area. It's not a territory. All our territory belongs right here. No Manitoba, no Saskatchewan, no Ontario, nothing. That's our territory. And we got to look at that all the time. We have to look at it from there. Who, who were we before 200 years before the white man came here? Who were we? We were Anishinaabe. We own this land. Like Terry said, creator put us here. He took four scoops of this land here and put together the, the body of Wenabajou. That's where the spirit came into the Wenabajou. This is our land. We didn't come from Israel or the lost tribe of Israel. There was a people that came across at Bering Strait. They came across there. But at that time, in their history, in their oral history, they say there was a people here already. 
and that is us. We were here already but when they crossed that, uh, that uh, Bering Strait. They said, they said the bones they find in the Bering Strait of our people, that's our people that they found, found in there. Those people came across here and became, uh, 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 what do you call that? Um, between the Mohawk and the Ojibwe when they were battling, they became peacekeepers of them. And they traveled south to Florida and they traveled west and then traveled north again. I don't know the name of that, that reserve, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Lawrence Henry knows that because he was the one that said this. They're the ones that uh, they, they say and he was sitting outside with an old, old man there, and that old man was pointing up at the stars. And he saw, he found a, a group of stars there. And he says, in our history, that's where we came from, he said. That's us that came from there. We, that's where we came from. And that's true. The makeup of our bodies is of the stars. We are of the stars, no matter what color you, or skin you have, your, your, your skin is of the stars. Let's, let's get it right now. We are Anishinaabe. And Terry was right about the Anishinaabe, the way you, or way you interpret Anishinaabe, uh, we're from whence lowered. Abe, the male of the species, but you can say El Nishinabe Kwe too. And so we need to we need to start talking differently about that. We can't be talking about their court system. We can't talk be talking about treaty land entitlement. We can't be talking about what, what else do you, you talk about? The Paul and the INAC policy. We got to get away from that. We got to get away from this chief and council business here. We got to get back to our clan system. That's what we need to do. That's where the power is in our clan system. I asked a guy there that works in the program in uh, in Winnipeg. There, he says, uh, no, he he works in Treaty One, and we had a a, a gathering on August third in uh, Low Fort Gary. He says, do you have any direction? I asked him. <laughs> He's the leader of that uh, that clan of that uh, program, and he says no, <laughs> don't have no direction at all. He says, and then I told him the clan system will give you all kinds of direction. I told him, I don't have no direction. He says, and uh, just uh, I don't, <laughs> and uh, so we have no direction here in this in this community either, <laughs> with chief and council. We don't have no direction. We have money that comes in and money comes and uh, goes and and uh, but we have no direction. Where are we going with this? Why aren't people? Why aren't why why isn't this place all full of people? Because they don't believe in that. They don't believe in a chief and council system. You you won't hear anybody say that, but that's what it is. They don't believe in that. So. Oh, my gosh, you present the egg. That's in there. Jimmy, you got the kid. I hope I didn't offend anybody. <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah, the, the queen is not my mother, <laughs> <laughs> not my grandmother. <laughs> I have a grandmother here <laughs> and a mother. She's not my grandmother. That's where they got, I get this idea that, that maybe they can own the land. But uh, miigwech, miigwech, so. All right, thank you, Peter. Some good words. The food is here. We're going to take a break uh, for about an hour. <clears throat> We're going to have a, a meal and uh, uh, invite some more speakers and uh, Maybe ask some questions, uh, maybe some different areas of uh, uh, of treaty. We could uh, we could uh, add some some more. Yeah, uh, I know that we 
could have a few more uh, ideas come come forward. Okay, we'll take a break for an hour. <laughs>